Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, uh, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. We're surrounded, men of faith who've learned the art of perseverance. We're surrounded, women of courage who know what it means to face their fear and how it feels to get knocked down, but to now hold their crown of victory. So let's run this race until this race is done. Let's run this race until this race is won. We're running with giants. I get tasked this morning with keeping everybody from a three-year-old to a hundred-year-old entertained, and I'm going to do my best, uh, but I'm going to guarantee you that I won't. So I'm going to do what I can. Uh, I'm excited about this morning. For those of you who don't know who I am or have ever seen me teach before, uh, I teach without shoes on, so if everything else to this point has not been weird for you, that part probably is. So I want to explain to you why that happens. Um, so personally, it's a conviction of mine. Um, in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 3 and Joshua chapter 5, uh, two men, Moses and Joshua, have an encounter with God. And in that moment, God tells them to take their shoes off for the ground on which they are standing on is holy ground. Now, the ground didn't change. You can still go walk on the ground where they walked. What changed? The only thing that changed was the presence of God. Amen. And so for me, when I teach, I believe that God is here. I believe that he is present, and so as a mode of respect and reverence for him, uh, I take off my shoes uh, in that. I don't request that you do. Some of you, please keep them on. Um, I just wanted to let you know as to why, why I did. I love a good superhero movie. I think I've wasted more money watching superhero movies than I have anything else. So I need your help this morning. I'm going to throw some on the screen, and I need you to shout out who you think they are. Can we do that this morning? Can we do a little call and response? All right, let's throw the first one up there. Let's see what happens. All right, I need y'all to speak with confidence. All right, yes, that is Batman. But let's be a little bit more aggressive. All right, good. All right, throw up the second one. Yes, perfect. Good work. Yeah, second greatest of all time. All right, what about this lady? For those of you that are older, I know there's a different Wonder Woman, but nobody under the age of 70 knows who she is. So we're going to stick with this one. All right. I'm so sorry. That was my only jab today. All right. So up the next one. Yeah, great. Yeah. Nothing like the nastiest superpower, right? Being covered in that goo. Hey, maybe that's what you should do next year. Uh, all right. What about this last one? Of course, the greatest of all time. Hashtag America. Right. So all of these superheroes have a job. They have a purpose. Their job is to make right what is wrong with the world. Their job is to rid the world of evil and to replace it with good, to transform or change their culture and their world. And what I want to get after this morning is that you and I are tasked with the same job. Regardless of your age, if you're three or if you're 300, that you have the opportunity, the calling to change the world around you. And that even though we may not have superpowers, we have the power of God through His Spirit and His Word and I think is more powerful than anything else in this world. Amen. So I would love for you to turn your, in your Bibles to the book of Daniel. We're going to walk through some things this morning that the students did this week. Uh, we've, been running through, we've been going through this series called Running with Giants. And the whole principle has been wrapped up kind of around Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. So I want to read that for you this morning to kind of lay the foundation. And we're going to keep moving forward. Hebrews 12, 1 says this. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that, allows, or that slows us 
down. So the idea is uh, that in Scripture and even around us in our world, that uh, there's this crowd, this great crowd of witnesses, this, these giants of the faith, these people who we can look to and learn from. And so this morning, uh, we're going to take Daniel, and we're going to ask him to kind of come down from that crowd of witnesses and ask him, what would he say to us? What would he tell us this morning if he could come back and say something to us. And I think if I was going to take everything that Daniel did and put it into a small fragment, I would say that Daniel's words to us this morning would be to stand firm. Now, I know that there's an ellipsis up there. Those three little periods are intentional. And we're going to talk about why in just a minute. But I think if Daniel was to come down, he would say, stand firm in what you believe. It's easy for us to become passive. When our friends are getting bullied at school, Or when somebody's doing something wrong, it's easy for us not to say anything about it because we don't want to get involved. It's easy for you to to see your coworker or family member doing something and kind of go, well, I don't need to say anything about that. That's not my business. But what Daniel showed us is that it's important for us to take a stand for what's right. It's important for us to take a stand for things that matter. And he's going to show us today, I think, through four events in his life, why that's true. So we're going to look at Daniel chapter 1 first. I think if Daniel was going to teach us a few things out of the events in his life, the first event that changed his life was when he was taken from his home and taken to Babylon. Now, uh, has anybody here, uh, kids, I know this is going to be you this morning, anybody here ever gotten in trouble for what somebody else did? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, Man, that makes me mad, right? Like a family member does something, a brother, your sister, and they're like, all of you are in trouble. I'm like, that ain't fair, right? Or, or maybe it's a, a coworker or a friend, and they did something, but because you're in their department, like all of you get punished because of it, because you're associated with them. Or like even worse, you try to like minister to a really run down and, and rough group of people. I don't know, I'm just gonna spitball a group here, like a Steelers fans, for instance. Um, so you're just trying to reach out to those awful, terrible people, and you just get associated with them. Because I'm, jo- I'm, t- I'm not joking. I don't like the Steelers, but you're, God loves you. So, um, right, but we kind of get associated with the people that we hang out with. Or maybe it's worse. Maybe it's something like this clip. Maybe this is you. Oh, that would be me. Although, I don't know if I'd say loser, per se. Kind of is... <gasps> yeah. Oh, it's the girls. Not a good time. Hey! <gasps> yes, sir. Uh, ma'am, you're making me nervous. How could you let Balthazar Brat, the AVL's most wanted villain, just get away? That is the opposite of what we do here. Okay, okay, yes, maybe he got away. Again. But he didn't get the diamond, and I am this close to bringing him in. Close. Huh. Interesting. You're fired! <gasps> what? That's totally not fair. Gru is a great agent. You know what? If you fire him, you're gonna have to fire me, sister, sister. And do you really want to do that? Alleluia. No, 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 no. Ah! 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 Well, I guess she did. Huh? You. You know, it doesn't really feel good to be punished for somebody else's mistakes, does it? I mean, none of us are like, yay, that sounds great. This is the life of Daniel. The group, the nation that he belonged to, Israel, was considered to be God's people. But at the time when Daniel was living, they were making fake gods, and they were, in essence, worshiping those instead of the one true God. And so God allowed them to be conquered by this nation of Babylon. Now, Babylon was led by this king named Nebuchadnezzar who ruled for around 50 years. So taking over nations was kind of his thing. It's what he did. So Jerusalem, Israel, just another nation that he would take over. But what he did was interesting. Take a look at Daniel chapter 1. Look at verse 3. It says, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men. So glad I wasn't living then, you know what I'm saying? That was not a joke. All right, whatever. Make sure 
Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and the literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens, and they would be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. So Daniel and his friends get taken from their homes. They make a a 800 mile trek, which would have taken about four months from Jerusalem to Babylon, where they are trained and raised up in Babylonian culture. Now, two choices come to Daniel's mind, right? Choice number one, he allows the Babylonian culture to dictate how he lives. Or choice number two, he uses the gifts that he has to allow Babylon to see how, the, how God's culture is way better than anything Babylon can do. And that's what he does. From food to worship to everything else, Daniel uses his calling to change the culture of Babylon. And so we see something really important in that. And then there's a second event that the kids learned about this week. If you flip to Daniel chapter 2, we see that not only was Daniel taken to Babylon, but he was interpreting dreams. So this is a really interesting story. Nebuchadnezzar wakes up in the middle of the night with this awful dream. Have any of you ever woken up like in the middle of the night and just been angry, like your moods just change or you're scared because of what you're dreaming? A few days ago, I come home from work and Renee looks at me and she goes, I've been mad at you all day. I was like, what? I was, I was gone before you woke up. I haven't, what, what have I done to warn this? She goes, I had this dream about you last night. I was like, okay. She's like, well, you've never done it before, but it just made me so mad. I was like, what? Like, I can't even win when you're sleeping? Like, this doesn't make any sense to me. Right? We, we've all had those dreams that have shifted the way that our day goes, right? That have woken us up angry or scared or going, wait, is this real? Am I, am, am I, I'm good. Okay, I'm good. Right? The king has, this, has a dream very similar. He wakes up and he's so terrified that he brings in all of his wise men and magicians and astrologers and he tells them to interpret the dream. And they go, great, what's the dream? He has this kind of unprecedented caveat uh, you got to tell me the dream too. Tell me the dream and tell me what it means. Now, it's not uncommon for a king to demand the interpretation of his dream. This is a very commonplace thing in this culture. But it was uncommon for him to demand for them to tell them the dream. And so, take a look at what happens in verse 5. The king says to the astrologers, I'm serious about this, them telling him the dream. If you don't tell me what my dream was and what it means... Be torn limb from limb. Yay. Like, what if we're close? Like, do we get to keep half of our limbs? Like, what does that look like? And your houses be turned into heaps of rubble. So these guys are terrified. They respond to the king. And look at verse 11. It says, the king's demand is impossible. No one except the gods can tell you your dream. And they don't live here among people. The king was furious when he heard this. And he ordered that all the wise men of Babylon be executed. Whoops. Daniel, being one of them, catches word. He goes to the king and he tells him, whoa, whoa, whoa. Give me a day. Let me see what I can come up with. So him and his friends sit in the room. They pray. They ask God for wisdom. He walks into the court, the king's court the next day, tells the king his dream, tells him what it means, and changes the whole game. Now, why does this matter? It matters because Daniel wanted to prove something significant. Yes, little g gods don't live among people, but our God lives among us. He is present and he is here with us. And Daniel wanted to prove my God is way smarter than whatever fake God you can put out here. And so Daniel's second kind of big task interpreting dreams is a success. The third one Daniel's not really a part of, but his friends are. It's kind of a, a fiery furnace, if you will. All right, the king makes this 90-foot tall statue out of gold, and he tells everybody, when the music plays, everybody bow down and worship. Now, scholars will tell us that Daniel probably wasn't in the country at this time. He was probably off doing king-like duties somewhere else because of how close he was to the king. And so these three men stand up, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
Now they stand up and take a stand for what they believe. And the king brings them in. Because these are three men that he's invested a lot of years into. And these are probably teenagers at this point. And they're standing before the king. And the king says, look, just, look, just bow down. It's, it's fine. Just bow down so I don't have to throw you into the furnace. And their response is incredible. Check a look at Daniel chapter 3. Look at verse 16. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, I kind of just feel this like, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, you, we don't need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. Now, just stopping there, you're like, yeah, yeah, God's going to save you. And for, for a lot of us, we kind of stop our prayer here, right? Like, God, I would love it if you would save me right now from this really bad situation I'm in. And then God does, and you're like, ah, God's not real, see? God's fake. But look at their next sentence. This is pivotal to your faith. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Now we know as Christians that God shows up sometimes in ways that we can't explain. But we also know that sometimes God doesn't show up in the way that we want him to. Doesn't mean God's not there. It just means that maybe what's happening is working for a greater purpose that you don't even know about yet. And for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the chief lesson I could, I could share with you this morning is not like, look how fancy they are. Look how cool they were standing up. But as Christians, we will never be able to bring the world to Christ if we become like them. Our job is not to fit in. Our job is to stand out and to stand up. And for Shabbat, Meshach, and Abednego, they took a stand for what they believed. And it changed the course of that country for a long time. Well, eventually Nebuchadnezzar dies, and the last story the kids learned about was probably one of my favorites. Daniel hanging out with some lions in a den, right? So Daniel is continuing to kind of grow in favor before the king, and even this new king, Darius, likes him so much that he's kind of put him in charge of a lot, and all of the other officials don't like it. So they concoct this plan. If we can just get Daniel to do something wrong, then we can kill him. And so they do. They trick the king in assigning this decree that says, if anybody prays or worships anything other than you, King Darius, then they should be thrown into the den of lions. And Darius says, okay, that sounds cool. Signs the decree. And Daniel, look at verse 10 of chapter 6. I love this. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, I mean, come on. Like Daniel wasn't like, hey, they, uh, they signed it. Like he was like, just did? Great. I'm going to go home. I'll be back. When Daniel learned the law had been signed, he goes home. He kneels down in his usual upstairs room with the windows open towards Jerusalem. And he prayed three times, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Daniel hears the decree has been passed and goes, great. I'm going to go home and pray. And the guys follow him home. And they come back to Darius and they say, Darius, Daniel's praying to his God. And Darius, who loves Daniel, begrudgingly goes, bring him. We'll throw him in the pit. So they open up the pit of lions. They throw Daniel in. They close the pit. And then the king goes home. And he's restless all night long. He doesn't sleep well. First light, he comes running out, goes down to the pit. And I just, I just envision Daniel just kind of sitting there, like, oh, hey, all right, Darius, what's going on, man? Sorry, yeah, I was just hanging out. These are probably my new favorite animals. Do you mind if I take one home with me? I love it. Yes, this one's, I love, I've named all of them. If you'd like their names, this is really pretty animals. I just love them so much. Do you have a scratching pole somewhere? They really, their claws are so big, right? Daniel's just hanging out, unscathed, unscratched, seemingly bored maybe. I don't know, he's been praying all night with the lions, 
And Darius brings him out, and he goes, we're only going to serve your God. I don't know who these guys are. Throw them in the pit. And then the, the, the you know, lions have been fasting all night long, praying with Daniel. And so they're hungry. So they throw in some fresh meat, and the, you know, if you want to read the text, it's great. So they, rip them, they rip them apart. It's good. But here's the thing. In, in a culture that often says, be afraid. There is no hope, right? You turn on the news, and the news channel's not like, look at all the good things that happened today, right? The news channel you turn on, you're like, oh, great. Here's 30 minutes of the worst things that have ever happened in the world, and 30 seconds of one good story that we filled in. If you were to watch the news, you'd be like, there's, there's no hope for us. And we, like Daniel, have to rise above the fear and instead turn to the true source of hope and courage. We can't find our hope in the news. We find our hope in Jesus. So why should we stand firm? I told you there was going to be an answer to that ellipsis. And if you were at VBS this week, you know, because God is with you. Daniel would say, stand firm, because my life is a testament that God is with you. And here's a common response. But I don't don't feel like God is with me. Whew. So let me just um, shut that down for a minute. Uh, I, I think I'm just going to be super straight up with you. I think this is a stupid answer. Sorry, I don't know if that's too blunt. If that is, I'm super sorry. I hurt your feelings. But let me tell you why. Because I don't feel like God is with me. I am a, I'm not an emotional person. Uh, you can ask my wife and children. I don't cry a whole lot. I, uh, I just, I'm just kind of a stoic dude. I love thinking. I'm a very critical thinker. So oftentimes when I come in on a Sunday morning or on a Sunday night with the students, like I'll stand in the back and be like, gosh, have you all thought about how stupid this is? I, I know, look, don't, please don't be offended by what I'm saying. I'm just going to be super transparent with you. I'll stand in the back and be like, why, why do we sing the songs we do? Like how weird is communion? Like why are we raising our hands in worship? Like I just kind of look at the whole thing and go, Boy, this is kind of lunacy. And I think if I only trusted my feelings, that I would have walked away from the church years ago. And it's not a surprise to me that many people with critical minds walk away from the church. Because oftentimes the church doesn't answer the critical-minded questions. They just go, believe in Jesus. He's a fluffy butterfly that floats in your stomach and makes you feel real good when you're not, when you're not happy. And I just want to be like, that's such garbage because there's kids in the room. That's, that's doo-doo, if you will. I don't have to feel like God is here in order for me to know that God is here. Amen. So I would just encourage you to stop trusting your feelings and to start believing the facts. And I wish I could stand up here and wax eloquent to you the facts of who Jesus is and why it matters or wax eloquent to you about the 25,000 times that they've tried to disprove Scripture and all 25,000 times have come back as false. Like they can't disprove the Bible because of the facts and the dates and the places and the times. They all line up with everything that everybody else has found in history. I wish I could stand up here and tell you for hours about why I know that what I believe and what I do is true. Because I don't walk in here on a Sunday morning and hope for a fluttery experience. I walk in here this morning standing on the facts that Jesus is who he says he is, that God is real, and that you and I have the opportunity to have a relationship with him today. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't trust their fluttery feelings. They knew who God was, and that was their confidence. There are people throughout history who have stood firm on what they believed, not on what they felt. Somebody like Rosa Parks, who who knew that what was going on in our culture in that day and age was wrong. And she took a literal seat for what she believed in, not because she was tired, not because she was old, but because she knew that culture had to change. She didn't feel this butterfly in her stomach and go, I guess I should sit down. She knew that culture had to change. Somebody like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who lived in Germany during the Nazi regime and knew that he had to speak out against the Nazis, that there was nothing else he could do. Even though he was given the opportunity to leave Germany, he spoke vehemently, aggressively against the Nazis. 
ended up in a camp and ended up being executed for what he believed in. But he knew that he had to stand firm, not because he felt this little butterfly, but because he knew the facts that God was real and he had to take a stand for what was right. There are many others in our history. Martin Luther King, Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill. You could go on and on for days about people who took a stand for what was right. Not because they felt about it, but because they knew that they had to make a difference. You and I have the opportunity to do the same thing. You and I have an opportunity to take a stand for what is right, to take a stand for what is good, to take a stand for what is true. And you and I, regardless of our age, if you're three years old, you're 30 years old, you're 90 years old, it doesn't matter. God's, I think Matt said last week, if you're still breathing, God's not done with you. And it's time for us to take a stand in a culture that says to sit down and shut up. It's time for us to stand up and to take a stand for what we believe in because God is worth it. And if nothing else is true, I know that this is true for me, that God has been worth it in my life and that following him is far more valuable than anything that you can receive in this world. So church, it is time for us to follow after Daniel and to stand firm today. And if you are struggling this morning, if you're in that place of thinking and not feeling, and you're like, this all seems like a load of garbage, I would love to talk to you. I would love to talk to your family. I don't care who it is, because that's me, and I know that that's so many people in this world, and I would love to sit down and have a conversation with you. Let me pray for us, and then we'll be dismissed. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity we have to worship. Thank you for the opportunity we have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt you are real, that you are good, and that you are for us. God, help us to be strong and courageous, to take a stand for what we believe in, and to know that you are walking right alongside of us. May we enter the gates of heaven with a well-done, good, and faithful servant. Jesus, we are thankful for all that you've done for us. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Church, you guys have been great. Y'all have a great week. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember, you belong at ACC.